So my name's Hira Verdi, and I'm a PhD researcher here at UCL. And what I want to talk to you about today is um, you know, a huge problem, which I don't think many people um, will appreciate the severity of, um, or even that it exists. And that problem is space debris. Now, for the purposes of today, we'll treat space debris as any inactive satellites or fragments or parts of satellites which are currently in orbit around the Earth. There's, there's a saying that what goes up must come down, but when we're talking about space and satellites, really the timescales aren't that reasonable. So it might take 50 years, it might take 100 years, it might take several hundreds of years for an object to deorbit naturally, and that's if it ever does. And this has led to a huge body of orbiting debris. Um, but before we go into the details of um, what's up there, let me give you a few seconds just to think about the most critical day-to-day -day uses of, modern space, of, um, of space in modern society. And so um, which kind of technologies that we use from space um, would have the biggest impact on our day-to-day -day lives if they were to disappear overnight? Um, okay, so um, you know, I'll give you a few examples. Um, so an obvious one would be communication. Um, so we have many communication satellites. We transmit voice, video, and data up to satellites and receive it at other locations on the ground. But also, um, you know, the mobile phones that we all use, um, the cellular networks which our mobile phones run on, the transmitters for those cellular networks actually use GPS satellites to synchronize the transmitters. Then we have banking. So in stock markets, the GPS time is used to tag transactions. We have um, the direct applications of navigation. So that's the GPS constellation and the other navigation constellations. And that's widespread throughout the transport infrastructure. We have um, satellite TV. And uh, you know, more recently, we have satellite internet and satellite phones. Um, and uh, you know, th these are all important uses of space. And then we have some more kind of peripheral uses of space. So for example, in farming, some of the modern farming machinery um, actually uses GPS to automate um, kind of planting and harvesting. Um, but then further to that, uh, many farmers use earth observation data to monitor the status of their crops and to monitor the, the health of their land. And then we have weather. So the weather forecasts um, all rely on earth observation data from satellites for their predictions. And whether or not we use weather reports, um, the Earth observation data that comes from these satellites actually teaches us a huge amount about the Earth's surface and about the atmosphere. Um, and kind of further to the Earth observation from satellites, we have a lot of scientific experiments um, which teach us more about nature, um, which are space-based. And I, I think uh, you'll agree that all of these are fairly critical applications of space technology in modern society. Um, and then we have manned spaceflight. Uh, so a good example of this is the International Space Station. And so um, the International Space Station has to make maneuvers to avoid debris um, many times every year. And so the um, astronauts will uh, kind of move into the escape modules just in case um, you know, there's a collision. And only a month ago, um, a piece of debris tore a hole in one of the solar panels on the International Space Station. Um, so if the scenario got much worse um, for debris, then we could see a, a kind of future where human access to space would be limited. Um, so the probability of a collision with debris would be too high for us to justify sending humans through um, orbit and out into space. Um, so let's, let's imagine for a minute that overnight, all of the uh, modern satellite technology were to disappear. You'd wake up in the morning, you wouldn't be able to use your phone. So no texting, no calls. You switch on the TV, firstly there's no weather report and, that's, uh, and the TVs aren't working in the first place. Um, we have um, you know, widespread um, uh, limitations in the transport system because those also rely on satellites. And the repercussions would be as far as the financial markets. So you know, it would be a pretty bad day if uh, you know, something were to go wrong with many of our satellites. Um, okay, so I think we've gone over why um, you know, satellite technology is so important for modern society. So let's have a quick look at what the scenario is in space currently. Now this is Sputnik, and Sputnik was the first man-made satellite to be launched into space. 
and that was launched in 1957. So since Sputnik, we've had over 5,000 space launches. And they've resulted in a scenario that looks something like this. So this image shows every piece of debris that's larger than, say, a tennis ball. And uh, these aren't to scale, but the point in this image is to sh just to show you the sheer number of debris and their rough kind of um, orbits around the Earth. I'm not sure if that's... Yeah, you can just about see it. Yeah, so let's have a quick look at the, at the numbers. So um, like in the previous slide, there are some 20,000 large pieces of debris which are bigger than um, a tennis ball. Then we have some half a million objects which are from the size of a marble up to the size of a tennis ball. And then we have estimates ranging from millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of objects which are smaller than a marble. And each of these objects poses a different threat to those spacecraft which I mentioned earlier. Now, what I find really amazing is that in just over 50 years of satellite technology, we've gone from a scenario where there's not a single man-made object in space to one which is congest as congested as this in just 50 years. And so how exactly did we get to this? The main um, sources of space debris are firstly explosions of satellites and secondly collisions. So let's have a look at two of the key events in the space debris timeline, uh, in the recent space debris timeline. So the first of these is an anti-satellite weapons test which took place in 2007, where a satellite was blown up basically to prove that it could be done. And um, this generated some 2,000 large pieces of debris and countless smaller pieces of debris. Then in 2009, a, an active satellite collided with an inactive satellite and again, this produced almost 2,000 large pieces of debris which can now be tracked from Earth. Um, so this video, okay. Now, the reason why this is such a big problem is because in the near future, we could see a, a situation where there would be this cascading, runaway, kind of exponential effect where one collision goes on to cause a chain reaction of more collisions and so on. And you can see that within 100 odd years, we could get to a scenario where it would be unfeasible to send humans into space. Okay. So much for what the problems are. Um, let's have a look at what we can do about the, about the um, current situation. So the first thing to do is to try and have a look at what's up there. And that in itself is no mean task. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have um, optical telescopes we have radar networks, and we have laser ranging. And all of these techniques combine to give us some idea of the larger objects in space. Um, and an amazing thing about um, uh, optical capabilities now is that we can see an object the size of a smartphone that's some 35,000 kilometers above the Earth in geostationary orbit. So once we can see what's up there, we can start to think about tracking those objects and trying to uh, you know, predict their future locations. And so to predict where they would be in the future, we use physics and we use complex physical models, which include gra um, gravity models, drag models, radiation pressure modeling. And these tell us a lot of information about where objects might be in the future. And what that enables us to do is to predict collisions. So if we know where an active satellite might collide, we can then try and do something about that. And a final step um, to kind of alleviate the problem to some extent would be to remove some of the larger objects to try and present, uh, prevent that kind of cascade runaway effect of larger objects colliding and breaking into many smaller objects. But as with the whole kind of research field surrounding space debris, um, it's all in its infancy. This is a relatively modern field. And so we'll see a lot of innovation, I think, over the next um, couple of decades into the observation, into the modeling, and into the removal of this debris. It's not something which is um, you know, quite happening yet, but I think this is something which really will, will be um, you know, em an emerging market over the next couple of decades. And so, to kind of conclude, um, you know, this, is a, um, this is a big problem. And we wouldn't want to be limited in our access to space. We wouldn't want to be limited um, you know, in terms of sending humans into orbit or beyond. 
and we wouldn't want to jeopardize our current satellite technologies um, you know, with space debris. And so you might wonder what all this is. Um, the, the, this is the Chinese expression for crisis. And so the first character represents uh, danger, but the second character represents opportunity. So we have a big problem. There is a lot of danger surrounding this, but this is also an opportunity. And I think we can apply creativity and innovation through the fields of scientific analysis, through engineering, and through technology to try and remediate this problem. Thank you. <laughs>